Time to get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are happy to have you on board here with us tonight at the Rotary Club of St. Petersburg, Russia. And many of you have already been here to St. Petersburg and you know what it's like in the past. Right now, we're coming up to the time that's almost white nights. Now, according to the Russian calendar, they do a little bit different than some other places. Yesterday, June 1st is the official summer here. You know, a lot of places wait until around the 2021st, but here it's one June. And we have right now only about five hours of darkness each day. Otherwise, it's light till 1030 at night, 11 o'clock at night, still light. And then getting up in the morning, 430, the sun's up again. So we have a lot of light. And if you haven't done it before and you ever get a chance to come back to Russia during white nights, middle June time frame, 15, 20, 25 June, it's really, really nice to go for a long walk about 11 o'clock at night in the middle of the week. Most of the local people are sleeping because they're working. They got to get their sleep before they get up the next morning and go to work. There's not a lot of people on the streets or in the parks, but it's still daylight. And it's a beautiful time to take a walk in St. Petersburg, 11 o'clock at night in the middle of June. Might sound a little crazy, but if you try it, I'm sure you're going to like it. So welcome, everybody. We are very, very happy to see you all here tonight. We've got about 30 folks on board that who come not to hear us, but to hear Helen. So certainly we're, we're very happy to have you here. Let me go to my next screen here one second, and I'll get to my president's comments and the, and the itinerary, or the, excuse me, the agenda. Just one second, I'll get there. All right. So I'm going to have my opening comments. And then after my opening comments, we're going to go through other things. I'm going to go through the protocols now and just kind of set things up for the rest of the meeting and our protocols. For those of you who are new, something that we do at every meeting and we're going to do again this evening, <clears throat> we go through the four way test. I would like everybody on the screen, everybody, please turn on your microphone. Yes. Unmute yourself. Everybody, please turn on your microphone. Okay, I'm going to read the four way test. And after I read each one, I would like for you as a group to repeat it after I finish the four way test of things that we think, say, and do. The first one is Is it the truth? Is it the, is the, the truth? truth? Is it fair to all concern? Is it, is it fair, fair to, to all, all concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Will it build goodwill, goodwill and, and better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concern? Will it be beneficial to all concern? Very, very, very good. Thank you very, very much for that. I appreciate everybody participating. Somebody's got somebody's got a phone on making noise. If you will, everybody now, if you please will mute yourself. If you please will mute yourself now, please. We're going to have the Rotary mission statement. We provide service to others and promote integrity. This is one of the keys in Rotary. The fact that we do have integrity and we come through when we say we will. We're beholding ourselves accountable in Rotary for years and it's really good helping to understand, advance world understanding, goodwill, and peace through fellowship and business and professional connections. It, it's, it's what we're gonna be talking about tonight is peace. And we are the promoters of peace around the world and we're trying to make that grow. Now this evening, I would like everybody, while Helen's giving her presentation, please leave your microphone off so that we don't disturb her. Microphone off, but leave your camera on. Please leave your camera on so we can see your smiling face. Also, if you'd like to see Helen or other people who are speaking better, up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a speaker's view. If you click on that view and mark speaker's view, you will get a full panorama view instead of a little bitty icon of Helen with her presentation. 
I have eliminated one item tonight. Normally I tell people, please do not speak about sex, religion, and politics. Tonight we will be talking a little bit about politics. Helen will be talking about that. So I have marked that out. So tonight, no, no talk about sex and religion. And the reason we do that is because our meeting will be recorded. We do record our meetings and Randall posts them about three days afterwards. So you'll all be able to see at Helen's presentation again, if you would like to. So these are the protocols for tonight's meeting. Okay. Now, my president's opening comments. It is interesting to me that we are going to be having the online conference again this year for the second time. And I'm not quite sure what to expect. We know that the ICC group and those folks have a increased presence in this year's conference and they're going to try to make a bigger impact. And what are we doing? Our little bitty club that we have here, we've got seven members and we're growing again because we got down to six and now we're back up to seven and we're growing. We were up to 24 at one time. So we will get back there just a matter of time. But what's this little club doing? This club as a team is bringing on board guest speakers. And that's our primary focus right now. People who are speaking about Russia, who are speaking about international affairs, who are speaking about things that interest our audience. And we feel that is our destiny to bring these speakers out and let them speak. Let everybody hear what they have to say. And then we record it and put it out if even people who miss this want to see it later. The people we're bringing in here are high impact people. These are people who have clout. These are people who have a position in Rotary who is making, who are making a difference, <clears throat> excuse me, who are making a difference. And that is important. And every one of you, everyone here on the screen, all 33 of you can make a difference as an individual or a bigger impact as a group. And that's the benefits of Rotary. Even the single Rotarian, when he is out and about in the world and he's met by other people and they see your Rotary pin or they see your badge or they see your shirt with the Rotary logo, they ask you, what is Rotary? That is your opportunity to tell them about Rotary. That's your opportunity to tell them about people who care, people who wanna make a difference, people who are committed to helping the world. That's what Rotary is all about. And we need you to continue to do that. Our club is dedicated to bring the speakers on board. You should all be dedicated to be your own individual speaker when you have the opportunity to talk about Rotary and all the good things we do. If you do that, Rotary will continue to grow and it's gonna get bigger and better than it's ever been before. And now we're connected around the world. The 33 people we have on screen, many of you, our club members have never met before. A few we have, because you've been to St. Petersburg here before, but most of you not. And therefore, we're getting a chance to meet you, see you, and you could actually meet each other. I found two people who showed up at our meeting, a lady named Sharon and a lady named Heidi. Both spoke here, both very powerful, and they had not seen each other in years and years and years. And they found out that they don't live that far apart. So they're gonna be meeting up again. So sometimes even at a club like this, unexpectedly, you might run into somebody you haven't seen in many years that you might wanna see again. So if that happens, I hope you make that connection big and strong again. So we will keep doing what we're doing. You keep doing what you're doing and keep speaking to single people and to groups whenever possible. That finishes my president comments this evening. I'm gonna pass it over to our secretary and see what our secretary has to say tonight. Randall, the virtual screen is yours. Uh, Michael, I don't have anything really substantial to say other than to reinforce what you said, which is uh, we welcome people to speak to us and all of you are potential uh, speakers who could come and visit our club. So if you have an interest in sharing a topic, please let me know and we would be happy to schedule you for the future because we will keep doing this uh, in the coming Rotary year. Back to you. Thank you. Also, one thing Randall did not, did not announce is that we are almost one, we're one member away now from being 100% Paul Harris Fellows. And I'll make that announcement next week to bring it up to date. And we'll have one person left and we will try to close that within the next month or two, because we would hope 
before we get to the convention, we hope that we're able to have the point where we are 100% Paul Harris fellows in our club. Not all the clubs in the world can say that. It's a one-time thing once you achieve it and we're working towards that. We're trying to get there. We're very, very close. So we'll see what happens with that. And later on, I'll be talking to you about our main project that we have. And there are some of you who are already now speaking up this evening in our chat saying that you're working with some other people and thinking about making donations. We will be talking about that. So those are things that are on our list. We're trying to continue to grow and provide you the service that is necessary. And I don't wanna take any more of Helen's time. Helen, you're gonna have about 30 to 35 minutes to speak. And then we're gonna open it up to questions and answers for another 10 or 15. So uh, that'll take us past the, in, the, in, the top of the hour. So. I'm gonna turn it over to Helen in a moment, but I got a few things to do to divulge about Helen now. Yeah. How many of you, I'm gonna actually see a raise of hands. How many of you have visited more than 110 countries? Anybody? I know Helen has. Anybody been more than 110? My number's that, oh, do I see one down there? Richard, okay, Richard. That, not many people can say they've been to more than 110 countries. She's been to 114 countries. So she feels she has a connection in almost every country that she went to. And she is truly a world or global citizen. Uh, I know I've been to, I've worked in 18 and been to 30. And I thought that I was a global citizen. I don't even begin to hold a candle to this lady who's been to that many. So her view on, on Rotary is that Rotary has already proven that it is ready to help in the world peace effort. She believes that we're ready doing that and we should do more of it. And she's going to be speaking to us about that tonight. She's a full-time peace activist. You know, she's also, she was before a computer executive. Now, I don't know what a computer, computer geek executive is doing running around the world talking about peace but maybe there's an inside line there to the, to the people who are so many geeks and so many electronic computer people nowadays. Maybe she can relate to them very well and maybe that comes across very well. So we'll see about that in her presentation tonight. But she has spoken to clubs and districts and places about her project and what she cares about. And tonight she's gonna to be expressing her, herself to us. She's also brought along a few members so some of these Helen lovers that are on the screen, that's great. We want to see those supporters for sure. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the screen over to Helen. Helen Peacock, the virtual screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I've come to a number of these meetings and I find them all so engaging. They're just so engaging. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I'll just take a moment to screen share. And can everybody see that? Yes. And everybody can hear me? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I am talking about peace today. I'm talking about world peace. And I'm asking the question, is it a pipe dream or is it a possibility? And by world peace, I, I mean the absence of war as a means of resolving conflict. I don't mean the absence of conflict, but I mean the absence of war. Is it possible? And I have another favorite question, I call the mystery question. Why do we still have war anyway? I mean, if survey after survey says that people want peace, how come we still have war? So before we look into that more deeply, I wanna tell a brief story of an experience my husband and I had last year just before the pandemic hit. We were in Panama City and I had remembered watching um, the Panama invasion on television back in 1989. We were reading about that and we were learning that it ha had been concentrated in an area called El Chirillo, because that was where the headquarters of the Panamanian army were. And we wanted to go there, but our hotel concierge refused to help us uh, saying that he did not recommend we go, he could not guarantee our safety. So we talked to a friend we'd made on the street and reluctantly he said he would take us provided we slumped down in the car. And he said, it wasn't just our safety, it was his safety too, because we looked American and he would be with us. And so we're still taking this with a grain of salt. We slump down in the car. And within two minutes of going into El Chirillo, we see this very fresh, very large, very angry mural. And you can see the helicopters up here and you can see the soldiers down here. And for those of you who don't speak Spanish, this means never forget, never forgive. And we're thinking, 
what are we missing here? This was 30 years ago, and this anger is so fresh. And what we were missing was the fact that 4,000 civilians had died in the Panama invasion, most of them from El Chirio. And what we were missing was the incredible trauma that had been inflicted on this community. Just a few days before Christmas, in the middle of the night, they were asleep in their beds, and then this. And people were found dead in their homes. There were people found actually fused to their cars because some new kind of um, um, laser weapon was being tried out. There were people found with bullet holes in the back of their head. Everybody was evacuated from their homes and systematically block, block by block, the homes were blown up and burned to the ground. And all we could think was, how come we didn't know this? Why didn't we know this? Now, the other story I wanna share is just very briefly my experience in Rotary, my personal experience. And when I joined, you could not possibly have been more enthusiastic. I was already involved with World Beyond War. I was already starting a, a local peace group here in Collingwood, Ontario. And I was, I was thrilled with the partnership between uh, Rotary and the Institute of Economics and Peace. I was, I was ready to go. And over my first year, I was having trouble finding how I could contribute, where I could contribute. And I started to have questions. I mean, if war is the greatest threat to peace, what was Rotary doing to help end war? And I knew that there were two trillion taxpayer dollars, that's our money, taxpayer dollars, that were going into war and the preparations for war. What was Rotary doing to help reverse that or get some of that money diverted to positive peace building? And finally, how was Rotary using its voice at the UN and on the world stage for the kind of big system uh, global shifts that we needed to shift to a peace culture. And I wanted to do these things. I wanted to work on ending war and making people aware of these military dollars. I wanted to look at it from a big systems point of view because I knew that there is a huge military industrial war machine out there that was basically undoing all our good deeds. And I, I couldn't just ignore it. And I didn't see then how Rotary could help me with this. This was about a year ago and I actually resigned, but I was literally only gone for a month when I was invited to come back as district peace chair, given a mandate from heaven to talk about all aspects of peace, the positive peace initiatives and um, what it would take to end war. And I was very excited again, but that only lasted a couple of weeks when I was given a, a stop order and told that actually all I could talk about within our district was Rotary's positive peace initiatives, the peace centers and the peace scholars. Now I love the peace centers and I love the peace scholars, but that wasn't enough of a mandate for me. But I decided to hunker down and learn what I could about what was going on internationally with Rotary, because up until this point, I'd had a kind of Canadian point of view. And I talked to district peace chairs, different chairs. I went to, a, I probably went to a dozen peace conferences, podcasts, speakers events. I took every online course being offered by Rotary Action Group for Peace and by the Institute of Economics and Peace. And I took two or three in-depth courses being offered by World Beyond War, I was busy. And on top of this, I was put on a mailing list without any sort of context around it. And I was receiving 30 plus emails per week from Rotarians working within Rotary to prevent nuclear war. Now, nuclear war wasn't on my radar screen at all. And this, these emails were going right over my head. So I created a folder in my inbox and had them go directly there. And I read them over the weekend. But something happened over this period. I felt a shift inside me and I became convinced, absolutely convinced that Rotary could be instrumental in shifting our planet to peace. And I'd like to share just a couple of the experiences that were so pivotal. One was a conference I went to put on by a Rotary club in India and a Rotary club in Pakistan. And there they were, two nuclear power countries with leaders who were perfectly com comfortable using religion to divide and a disputed border between them. And they were talking about how to decrease the tensions. I didn't know anybody there, but I felt absolutely privileged to be at that conference. And the second thing was a podcast that was put on um, by an, a Western group about the quote, Russia problem. And I take everything that we hear in the Western media, media about Russia with a grain of salt. And I'm listening to the talking heads talking and a voice comes from the audience, a Rotarian, who I believe is on this call right now. And she said, has anyone ever thought about talking to the Russian people? And I thought, yeah, what a concept. 
Instead of these talking heads, we could talk to the Russian people. And I went and looked it up. And as we know from last week's meeting here, there are 77 Rotary Clubs in Russia. Some are flying below the radar screen and, and some are very quiet, but there are 77 clubs in Russia. Isn't that fantastic? And there are inter-country committees between Russia and the US and Russia and Canada. Isn't that fantastic? And then there was a Rotary Peace Incubator Conference. I know several of you may have attended that. There were 50 proposals and one of them just blew me away. It was a partnership between World Beyond War, one of my hats, and Rotary Action Group for Peace, the other one of my hats. Alison Sutherland and the um, Director for Education at World Beyond War, Phil Gittins, who happens to be a Rotary Scholar. And they were gonna put together 10, 10 young people from 10 different countries for an online peace building course given by World Beyond War. And then they were gonna mentor these people to do implement a peace project in each of their own countries. And the countries were Cameroon and Uganda and Colombia. And I was just, what an opportunity for Canadian kids to get a window into the world, be rubbing shoulders with their peers in these countries. And we had the Canadian team put together and funded. And, and in there, we were the number one team for this pilot project, which is starting in September. Which now brings me to the emails. So I'm reading these emails. I'm diligent about reading them. And they are going over my head, but gradually a lot is sinking in. And I'd like to share some of the insights I had. There were issues that I truly had not considered. And one was the, what I call the culture of denial. And of course I hadn't considered the culture of denial. I was part of the culture of denial. And so much so that let me just tell you a brief story. One weekend, literally, I had this epiphany I'm reading the emails and my husband is disposing three bins of my books and I'm feeling a little anxious and I run out and at the last minute rescue one book and this is it. And this was a book that meant a lot to me in the 80s because it was about how consciousness shifts. I'm really interested in how consciousness shifts. How do cultures evolve? Like how does consciousness shift? And briefly, it was the story about a, a group of Japanese scientists who were observing the monkey in the wild, the Japanese monkey. And at one point started dropping sweet potatoes on the beach. And the monkeys loved the sweet potatoes, but they did not like the grit from the sand. And then one day, one 18 month old female monkey took her sweet potato to a nearby stream and rinsed it out, ate the potato and loved it. And she showed her mother what she had done. Her mother loved it. And some of her, her friends picked it up and showed their mothers. And gradually there was a, a sort of small group in the tribe who were actually doing this. And then one day, one more monkey who had never done this before, took his sweet potato to the stream, rinsed it out, ate it, and he loved it. And to the amazement of the scientists, overnight, literally within 24 hours, nearly every member of the tribe had adopted the habit, as if the added energy of that hundreds monkey was a tipping point for the entire tribe. And this is what I mean by tipping point. Now, there's more to this story, but that's not why I'm telling you the story now. I'm telling you the story now because to my utter amazement, this was not a book about the hundreds monkey. This was a book about preventing nuclear war. And I had no memory of that. I remembered the book vividly. I remembered what it had meant to me. I had no memory that it was about preventing nuclear war. So I say that I was basically a poster child for the culture of denial. Other considerations I hadn't thought about, the fact that there are thousands of military personnel training continually so that they can launch a bomb in minutes to destroy our, our planet. Think about the, the mindset that's going into that. I mean, even as we speak right now, there are submarines roaming the ocean with nuclear weapons on them. Think about the mindset. And this whole first strike doctrine that we've been reading about here in North America, where the United States reserves the right to drop a bomb on you if they think there's a chance that you might be planning to drop a nuclear bomb on them. And we all know how flawed the United States intelligence can be. And it's not just the US. I mean, NATO has a first strike doctrine as well. Think of the fear that that's engendering. Think of the, the readiness and the alertness and the anxiety that that engenders in the world. We have to sort of always be on our guard. And this was a new one to me the threat of use, I mean, they haven't been used, right? Nuclear hasn't been used since the Second World War, right? I mean, maybe nuclear deterrence is working. Except if I take a gun and I hold you up, I don't shoot you, but I hold you up and I rob you. Have I used the gun? 
yes, I have. And that thread of use is out there all the time. And there was one pre pre presenter who actually said, told us about 30 times, known times that the US has actually used the threat. But the threat is always there. So don't think nuclear weapons aren't, quote, being used. Plus the potential for error, there was another presentation where the presenter laid out a timeline from the Second World War to today and showed us 50 times, guys, 50 times that we were this close to nuclear disaster. And of course, we don't know about that. I mean, the nuclear industry doesn't want us to know about that. The industrial military complex doesn't want to know about that. Know, know about that. And he said, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. When there's that many weapons out there, that many people handling them, that much going on, that much technology behind it, it's a question of when. And this one, really, if, if you think about it, how more fundamentally, un, fundamentally undemocratic could we possibly be to have allowed our world to get to the place where just a few people in a few countries can make a decision that can impact billions of us? How did that happen? fundamentally undemocratic. And finally, I don't need to belabor this, a staggering waste of money. I mean, now we're modernizing our nuclear arsenal or we're expanding it, weapons that we can never use. So here we are today. We have about 13,500 nuclear warheads out there in nine countries. Not one of these countries has a plan for recovery because there's no recovery possible. And it is those of us, you and me, who are outside the industrial military complex we are the ones who can see clearly <clears throat> that as long as there are nuclear weapons, peace is not possible. So I can answer my question from the very first slide, pipe dream or possibility? As long as there are nuclear weapons, it's a pipe dream. So back to my question, how did we get to this place? I mean, honestly, if we all prefer peace, how did we get to the place that we are now with $2 trillion going into war and the nuclear situation where it is. And Einstein said, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And I say that the level of consciousness that brought us here is based on old beliefs and fear and myth. So what are these kinds of beliefs? What do we keep hearing as a reason why we have war? Well, we hear war is inevitable. It's, it's part of the human condition, right? It's part of being human. We've always had it. We always will have it. Don't we hear that? And we hear war is necessary. There are times when you have to draw a line in the sand for, for freedom and democracy. And yes, there are times when war can be justified as a last resort, of course. I mean, after you've tried everything conceivable, you have to have it there as a last resort. And finally, the industrial military complex is just too powerful politically and economically. You don't stand a chance. Now, aren't these the kind of reasons that we hear? But we're Rotarians, so we ask, is it the truth? Is war really inevitable? And the fact of the matter is that conflict may be inevitable, but war is a choice. It's a choice. China went 500 years without a war. The countries of Western Europe who used to be fighting all the time have gone the last 75 years without a war. War is a choice. And as for war being necessary, there may be beliefs about that at the time of the Second World War, but this is 75 years later, and a lot of research has been done that shows that nonviolent defense is far more effective, twice as likely to be effective without the death and destruction that comes with war. And as for war being justified, remember, to be justified, it has to be a last resort, but nonviolent alternatives, the human mind is infinitely creative. Nonviolent alternatives are proving unlimited. So war can never be a last resort. And if someone tells you it is, ask them to show you the other 999 resorts that they looked at first. And as for this one, when enough people are educated on the suffering of victims and the environmental destruction of war, many people have not made the connection to the fact that a number one contributor to our climate crisis today is war and the preparations for war. So when enough people are educated on this, the political support will disappear and the power of the industrial military complex will diminish. Okay, so if those aren't the reasons why we still have war, why do we still have war? And John Horgan and many others has done ex exhaustive analysis, applying the scientific method to search for every conceivable possible correlation. And they found only one. Wars are made by cultures that celebrate or tolerate war. 
And we are living in a culture that tolerates war. And he makes the point that you can tell a pollster you oppose something, but real opposition means speaking up. Real opposition takes work. So we can think of it like this, the 250 wars since World War II, the money that is going into this, the situation now with nuclear war, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Our culture is so much broader and deeper. It's in our heads and our, our games and our books and our historical markers and our education systems and our monuments and our music, it's everywhere. Last year for Remembrance Day, the Globe and Mail, which is the business paper in Canada, had seven pages dedicated to Remembrance Day and did not use the word peace. Don't you think the word peace should show up? So how do we shift, given that it is so permeates our culture in so many ways, how do we shift our consciousness to a peace consciousness? And I told you there was something more to the story of the hundreds monkey, and this is it. The habit, it was just shocking. The habit of washing sweet potatoes jump over the sea. And monkeys on the mainland also started wash, washing their fruit in the stream. So it was as if there was this point when just one more person tunes into a new awareness, consciousness shifts so that that awareness can be picked up by almost everyone. And when we think about it, we know intuitively that that is true. We can look at the Berlin Wall. It was up for years. It came down on a weekend, came down on a weekend. Or we can look at the women's movement. I was part of a consciousness raising group in the 70s. It was exhilarating. And we all know that today, the world is completely different for our daughters than it was for our mothers. Completely different, consciousness shift. So we know intuitively this is true. So, Rotarians, I believe that we can bring that kind of awareness to shifting our world to peace. Peace is in our DNA. It's a fundamental core value of Rotary. It's one of our areas of focus. So let's go back to Einstein. How can we do this? How can we most effectively help? shift our world to peace? Well, we have to start with ourselves. And if I could use myself for an example again, how did I not know? I had watched the coverage on TV. How did I not know the impact of the Panama invasion? And my husband and I subsequently watched a documentary called The Panama Deception, which I recommend. And they analyzed all the television coverage over the entire period. And they concluded that television sold the Panama invasion. The anchors talked about it was a good day today for our troops and we did really well today as if they were members of the force and there was no mention, not once, of the dead civilians and no questioning of the reason for the invasion. Noriega was a drug trafficker, or really? And we all know that wasn't the reason for the invasion at all. And finally, my personal favorite, one night on the NBC News, the US military occupiers were described as engaged in peacekeeping chores, and you saw the pictures. While the Latin American diplomats who had condemned the invasion were described as a lynch mob. Now, I don't think that the television anchors were selling us on this consciously. I think that they were receiving information they believed to be true and they were passing it on to us. And I think I, sitting there listening to it, was receiving information that I believed to be true and I did not question it. And this is when we have to we, this is the, we have to develop a discerning mind around this so that we do ask the questions and we try to get to the bottom about what we're hearing in our news and so on. I also don't mean to pick on the US. It's just this example happened to be um, related to the US. So we have to look at ourselves first and wake up ourselves. And I know most of you in this audience, if not every single one of you, is doing that right now. Then we can look at the big picture and come back to the three questions. What is Rotary doing to help end war? How can Rotary make people aware of this money that's going to the military and get it shifted to positive peace building? How can Rotary use its voice on the, at the UN? And the fact that it's everywhere. Rotarians are everywhere. So I think if we want to answer this question, we consulted the scientists to understand how best to handle the pandemic. Let's cut, consult the scientists on this. I watched the entire unveiling of the doomsday clock. And we know that they left it at 100 seconds to midnight. And we know that their number one concern was the accelerating nuclear weapons program. That was their number one concern. So if we're going to listen to the scientists and we're going to take this seriously, we need to start, every single one of us, becoming familiar 
was the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It entered into force in January. And for the first time, we've had comprehensive treaties that outlawed chemical and biological weapons and so on. For the first time, we now have a treaty that makes nuclear weapons illegal for the countries who sign the treaty. And the treaty is oriented towards ultimately the total elimination of nuclear weapons. It also helps stigmatize nuclear weapons in the same way that chemical and biological weapons have been stigmatized. And even countries who haven't signed the comprehensive treaties don't use chemical weapons anymore because of the stigma. So it helps stigmatize nuclear weapons and serves as a catalyst for their eventual elimination. 86 states have signed the treaty. This is where we're at right now. 86 states have signed it, 54 states have ratified it, and 69 nations did not vote, including all the nuclear weapon states and all NATO members. Um, so that's where we're at. So how can Rotary make the biggest impact on raising peace consciousness? Well, I would suggest that Rotary could start advocating for worldwide support of the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I have permission to be just a little bit political here, but I can just imagine what many of you are thinking right now. She's suggesting we advocate for worldwide support of the treaty. God, what is wrong with her? What is she thinking? Doesn't she understand? She's been in Rotary for three years. She thinks she would have figured this out by now. Doesn't she understand? Rotary can't get involved politically. What is wrong with her? And my answer to that is this, I don't think so. Because I read Rotary Magazine in February of this year about Rotary's success in eradicating polio in Africa. I read the article three times. And these were the four challenges that Rotary faced in making this happen. And how did they deal with conflict? Rotary and its partners negotiated truces and military protection. I'd like to know how you can negotiate truces without being political. And what about the issue of rumors? Rumors were making vaccinations a political thing rather than a means to, to save lives. So what did Rotary do? They advocated with government leaders and educated the public to dispel this misinformation. Advocated with government leaders. That sounds political to me. And what about the hard to reach children? Well, borders are very porous. So what did Rotary do? They coordinated campaigns with surrounding nations, coordinated campaigns with surrounding nations. That sounds political. And then my personal favorite, political will. You know, there were countries in Africa where the political leaders really didn't care about eradicating polio. It wasn't a priority. So what did Rotary members do? They used their respected roles in society and often their own personal charisma to advocate to their governments to become active in polio eradication. Individual Rotarians went to the governments in their country and advocated for them to be active in polio eradication. That is the very definition of political. So I think we better properly describe our th thinking. Or when we say that Rotary can't get involved politically, I think what we mean is Rotary can't be partisan. Of course, we can't be advocating for this government over that one or, or this party over that one. But it is an indisputable fact that when it comes to saving lives, Rotarians can be brilliantly and effectively political, indisputable fact. And we could just as easily cross out eradicating polio in Africa and put in advocating support for the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and we would face exactly the same challenges. And we could overcome them with exactly the same um, um, strategies. We've already done it. We did it brilliantly. We did it effectively. We've already done it. We know how to do this, we do. So what would be a first step? A, an easy one. Um, we could apply the four-way test. Would worldwide support of the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and the elimination of nuclear weapons on our planet make us safer? And the answer, of course, is yes, 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 and yes. 
A second step, many of you may not be aware that last year there was a resolution that went to the Council on Resolutions from um, our district, Dist District 7010, requesting the Rotary International Board to consider supporting approval on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And that, that request went below my radar screen and I talked to our club president and he had no memory of it, but it did. And um, the Council on Resolutions voted and what do you think the result was? Two to one against. Now, I don't think our fellow Rotarians were rejecting the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons any consciously, any more than I think that the television anchors were consciously trying to sell us or me on the Panamanian invasion. I think that our fellow Rotarians were looking at this and thinking in a kind of automatic way, oh, that looks political, no. And so I think that with education, 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 that vote could change. And so what are we doing this year? This year, we have another resolution that's going forward um, from um, the same, again, from our district, again, requesting the Rotary Ent International Board to consider endorsing this time the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. But something a little different has happened this time. This pre presentation was first made about six weeks ago to the Rotary Club of Collingwood. And within two weeks, their executive had unanimously approved the resolution and had um, put it out to a vote in the club and only two members of a club of 75 had voted against it. But that's not all. People from, the, from our club reached out to contacts they had elsewhere in Rotary and told them about what we were doing and got them involved and many, many more presentations were given and at least 10 different districts now have a club in that district who is looking to, endorse, to approve the resolution and send it to their district to be endorsed. But that's not all. There was a presentation a few weeks ago to Australia and present in the audience were clubs from five different districts in Australia. And in the discussion afterwards, every single one of those clubs asked for a copy of the resolution so they could take it back to their home club and discuss it, hopefully approve it and send it to their district for endorsement. But that's not all. Another presentation was given sponsored by one of the 24 Rotary representatives to the UN and there were people there from all over the world. And at the end of that presentation, he was asked to send to six of these different um, clubs in six of these different areas. He was asked to send the resolution so they could discuss it with their club and raise it with their district, hopefully for endorsement. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of these districts are going to end up endorsing the resolution. I don't know where the process stands. I don't know whether they got club approval. I don't know. The deadline is June 30th and we'll know better after June 30th. But what I do know is that there are clubs that are now talking about this in all of these districts. And what I do know is that the end of every presentation, yes, there were a couple of people who strongly objected, but the vast majority of people were very on board with this. And I don't know that it's gonna be as difficult as we think. I do not know Shekhar Mehta, but I've heard him speak six times. I've heard him say these kinds of things. And I also, he put together a video recently asking us to grow Rotary to 1.3 million under his tenure. He wants another 100,000 Rotarians. And the strategy he is suggesting is everybody bring a friend. So we may have more um, openness there than we think, but we have incredible support from the general public. Remember I said, those of us outside the industrial military political complex, we are the ones who can see clearly that nuclear weapons must be eliminated for us to be safe. And surprise, surprise, since the treaty has been ratified, recent polls, 70 to 80% of citizens surveyed everywhere support the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Not everywhere, but nearly everywhere. And I would suggest to you that by endorsing the treaty, Rotary would be speaking for the 70 to 80% of citizens around the world who want this to happen. We would be amplifying their voice. We would be showing up for them. We would be recognizing how important this is to them. And I would suggest that if we do that, we become more of a compelling organization, we generate a lot more interest in Rotary. And that would be a perhaps better strategy for growing membership than everybody bring a friend. Which brings me back to my question. 
world peace, pipe dream, or possibility? What do you think? And we really would like to know what you think. So we have a very brief poll. I'll just stop screen sharing for a moment. And I'll just post this in the chat. So you can see at the bottom of the chat, there's a, um, a, a button to click on the poll. It won't even take a minute. These are very easy questions to answer. And if you would just take a minute and click on the poll and then come back. Thank you. I was muted, I'm sorry. We'll give you about another 30 seconds here and then we're gonna start. And I'm sure Helen and everyone else would be happy if you will do the survey and take that and fill it out. Uh, I've already done mine and we would appreciate that input coming to Helen. So um, some interesting questions that came out of this. So I'm sure we're gonna have some questions for her. So another few seconds here and we'll start again. <laughs> Could I have di some direction about how to find the survey? Oh. If you click on the chat and then go to the chat, you will see it from me. It's called Survey Monkey. I'm not seeing it. Yeah, if, if you'll scroll up a little bit, if, you, if you're just clicking on the chat now, scroll up just slightly, scroll up a little bit. It says from Helen Peacock, HTTPS www survey monkey. If you click on that, it'll take you directly to the survey. I've just put it in again. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you, Helen. I'm not seeing it. Oh, here we are. Okay, got it, all right. Okay, so for everybody, I would like all of us to give Helen a round of applause and tell her thank you very much. Super job, Helen, very good job. Very controversial subject, and I thought you handled it very, very well. Now, as we normally do for most of you who are on board, you know our normal procedures. I will uh, ask you to raise a hand and we'll get Helen a question and then uh, see what she has to say for an answer. So normally our secretary kicks it off first. Randall, do you have a question for Helen this evening? Well, thank you very much. Yes, I do. I, I, that was an amazingly well-structured, well-thought-out presentation. And I want to ask Helen, how many times have you given that presentation to polish it to such a high degree of <laughs> lustrous shine. I actually don't know how many times and it's been evolving over time too. So the first time I gave it, it was 45 minutes long and had a number of other examples in it. So 
it, it's being tweaked along the way. I, I probably have given it, I don't know, uh, Richard, do you know how many times? Um, have, have you give it, given it at a district level? No. No, you should, because it's just such a right. super, you're such a super job. Okay. Hmm. All right. All right, any other questions? Raise a hand, please. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Nadezda, you have your hand up? Go ahead. Unmute yourself first. Unmute yourself, Nadezda. Hello. Uh -huh. uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, I'd love to uh, ask uh, such a question. If you have given the presentation to the politicians, what was the reaction? And um, just from your experience, um, so at this point, the pre I've given the presentation to Rotarians and the general public only. I haven't actually been invited to give it to politicians. But I say again that for people who have spent their entire careers in politics or are part of the industrial military complex, they, you have to believe in what you're doing and their livelihoods have depended on this. And I don't think that the push to shift our world is going to come from our politicians. I think it's going to come from us. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Um, where Thank did you. Where did Anne go? Anne, you had your head. Anne, you had your hand up. Yes. Well, uh, well, this couldn't be more relevant. I am the incoming chair of a cause-based satellite club of the We Rotary for International Peace, and the name that we submitted was <clears throat> "A Planet Free of Nuclear Weapons." We just heard back from the people who register uh, the club and they said, you can't have a weapon in your club name. And I thought, okay. So I asked them to give me chapter and verse because when we revise it, we'll want to certainly make it right. So in fact, it doesn't say you don't, you can't have a weapon name in your um, club name. It says, you can't have a political viewpoint in your name. So, and then you can't display any rotor, any, any images that look like a weapon. So, well, there goes half of our program is displaying nuclear weapons or broken nuclear weapons, but the club name is important and we can't go for satellite club of peace so and normally i would not have raised this issue in a <clears throat> public rotary forum but it goes to your point helen that uh first they didn't tell it to me straight i'm i'm not i'm not imputing any malice on their part they're just trying to do their job but uh and then finally it says the secretary general shall determine if something is political. And I always knew there was that rule. So I've been dealing with this for four years now. Just want to let you know, we are still talking. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ann. Thank you, Ann. And just a note, just a note on that. When I was in the military, I was a deputy director general and people would come to me with a complaint and they'd say, you can't do this. And I'd say, what do you mean you can't do this? I said, do you have the book or the regulation that you can show me in writing where it says we cannot do this? And they said, no, but you can't do that. Sorry, that idea got thrown out. If you don't have page and verse and chapter saying what we can't do, we can do it. So um, we run into that frequently in the military. Okay, next hand up, anybody? Oh, Stan, go ahead, Stan, unmute yourself, please. Uh, hello, Helen. I'm speaking to you from uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, in the North Pacific Northwest of the United States. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Um, you know, I have to admit some uh, light bulbs went off during your presentation. Um, words, obviously, are very important. And the way one characterizes oneself, expresses oneself uh, as uh, and kind of was just talking about too. Um, yeah, you can't say I'm against this or against that. I'm for peace. I'm not advocating a political point of view. I'm for life. I'm for clean water, etc. Um, and uh, just uh, so 
Right. I mean, uh, you, that was that was so good the way you car used the four way test <clears throat> and showed that Rotary has taken political, not political points of view so much, but has done political work because in order to accomplish things in many places, I mean, you just have to. There's just no way around it. And uh, one other comment, you know, this isn't going to make me uh, very popular with uh, my gender, but uh, we need so many more women in leadership positions. Uh, I've been in a number of countries and done a number of things, and I will tell you that women generally get more done and do it in a more peaceful, cooperative fashion than men. And uh, it's, it's very difficult, you know, the, the male ego and testosterone, et cetera. Anyway, I, I thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Any comment, Helen, before I move on to the next question? No, I would like to see more women in leadership positions. I think that's <laughs> happening. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I agree. I agree. We should share the, share the boardroom with the women for sure. Next question. Any hands up for questions? Rami, go ahead, Rami. Uh, thank you, Helen, for this uh, courageous uh, presentation. Honestly, it, uh, it would be very challenging for me to speak in front of volunteers about such a controversial topic. Uh, what small what small steps can I take as a person who's living in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Russia? <clears throat> it's pretty a hot topic, pretty hot area. So what can I do small steps, not now, in order to promote this? I guess you could start by um, showing a copy of the presentation to a small group of friends and discussing it. Um, I also have come to I appreciate that. I think Russia's position on the nuclear issue is defensive um, as opposed to, I think it's purely defensive. Um, and so there's a, it's in a more unique situation perhaps in some of the other nuclear countries. But I would start by having a small group discussions with friends and ideas will come forward and ways in which you guys can um, create more awareness is that enough for you? <laughs> the first thing they will tell me, well, they got to stop first. So how yeah. would I answer that? Yes. Um, I think the stopping has to be done in a, um, um, uh, every, every nuclear arsenal in all nine countries has to be decreased by 10%. We need some kind of observable way in which everybody can be doing it at the same time. I, I agree with you. Um, so that Russia has to see that it's happening in the rest of the world before it's gonna do it. But I also think that as more and more countries ratify um, and sign the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the, the nuclear countries who do not want to give up their nuclear weapons, they don't want to, um, are going to be put more and more in a position where they are not part of the world at large. And we'll see what happens, happens then. Um, Richard and Anne, do you have anything you can suggest to Rami? I, I think one of the things certainly as um, what Helen has done today is the education and to raise the issue because I think that nuclear weapons are, it's an existential threat to us all, but nobody is talking about it. And uh, people are talking about the climate. In Rotary, uh, the climate was uh, a controversial political decision several years ago, and now it's our seventh area of focus. So things are changing in Rotary. And I think things can change in regards to uh, this issue as well. So education is the uh, first thing. And then there are things that uh, you can do, um, you know, small things such as uh, erecting a peace pole uh, that says, uh, may peace prevail uh, on earth um, and putting that in a, your rotary park or wherever. And that, again, just gets people to start to think about it. And then as you can, uh, you can in, endorse uh, as an individual and then as a club, uh, the Japanese survival uh, 
Bakshua appeal, which again uh, supports the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So you can do that as an individual or a, as a club. And so I think these are, are things that uh, you can do um, as individuals and as, as a club in, in uh, Rotary. And again, it, it's the grassroots that I think will eventually com uh, convince people. And then there, of course, as Helena said, uh, endorse uh, the resolution at the Council of Resolutions. The Council is uh, a recommendation to the board. It shows where uh, the membership is, is at although it is not a imperative that the board do anything about it, but it is uh, a way of expressing our views. So that's certainly a, another area and uh, would again, fully endorse Helen's appeal to endorse that resolution. Okay, very good. Very uh, Rami, good. I, wanted, I wanted to just add one more thing that just, uh, have you heard of the movie, The Man Who Saved the World? Sounds very familiar. Okay, well, he was Russian. And um, I, I, I would really recommend watching that movie. I, it, I thought it was quite, gave a lot of insight into the nuclear situation and he was a hero, so. Okay, uh, yeah. and just hang, hang on, Robert. Uh, Antonina, you're next, but before you do, I wanna make a comment to Helen. Helen, something else that you can do or someone in your group can do is take your presentation, turn it into an article and get it into Rotary International's magazine. It would be a great thing to put that into the magazine and reach the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are Rotarians to read that. There are, I don't know how many, if we had a million something, probably at least 100,000 people read it. So if 100,000 people read it, that's an art place you could put an article similar to your presentation that would be read by a lot of people. Something else you can do. I, I would support that. Absolutely. I think it's a great idea. Uh, Antonina, you're next, please. I'm not sure how you can hear me. It's okay. You have an echo, but you're okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. It's in chat. Okay. All right. Thank you. Put it in the chat. Thank you. Uh, Robert, you had a comment. You had your hand up. Yes, uh, from, from my perspective, it's a classic implementation problem because we're trying to go from awareness to advocacy and there's a step in between. And so Helen, I'm just saying, hang in there because there's that step of understanding that people have to have between the awareness, which you're doing a great job at and getting to people to really understand the problem before they can move to advocacy. So hang in there, it's a great cause. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Uh, uh, KK Chen, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you, Michael. Uh, Helen, it was a, an excellent presentation. I feel that uh, this kind of presentation should reach to every part of the world, every corner of the world. The main thing as Richard told that education is the main requirement, which is not prevailing and not happening uh, across the globe, where the education is not there in countries like India, Pakistan, where very few people are aware, they are not aware, most of the people are not aware. So education is one thing. And I have a weird uh, advice, probably you feel very weird because I find that uh, what all the meetings and what all we are spreading is not really reaching to the politicians is my uh, concern. It's not really hitting to the politicians. In order to hit to the politicians, the weird idea what I have is why not like-minded people who are so much interested can really contest into politics and if they get into the actual game of the Thing, and then that will become an igniter, that becomes a catalyst in getting the problem solved, I feel. Otherwise, things are not really, uh, I mean, reaching to the right people, the leaders, the politicians, all of that, whatever we are saying, I don't find any in the parliament of any of the countries discussing on this hot topic, which is very, very important. But uh, 
how can we get it to them so that ourselves getting into the politics probably it looks really weird but then that's what i feel thank you thank you thank you kk appreciate that any comment helen on that before we go to the next question i think we can be advocating with our respective governments in various ways we have petitions we have parliamentary petitions in canada right now about this we have other petitions we've identified um, politicians from our Senate and from all four of our political parties who are again, who want to eliminate nuclear weapons. So we're starting to make inroads. Um, I think we have to get to the place in all NATO countries where um, our prime minister in Canada can say, when he's faced with pressure from the US, he can say, look, if I don't sign the treaty, I'm not gonna get reelected. It's as simple as that. And that doesn't do you any good because the next guy is going to come in and just sign it. So you understand. And I think that's what we have to do. Right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Irina, you were next. Unmute okay. yourself, please. Thank there you, Mr. President. Uh, Helen, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. It's a lesson for me how to present my uh, lessons at, at university. The question is, I grew up in Soviet Union and I was taught that uh, America, that what America did with uh, uh, Japan, Japan, it was a terrible situation. But once I visited uh, Tennessee, Oak Ridge, and there I was in museum, and they showed me that American people were proud and excited what they did during this uh, uh, end of the war, Second World War. And the question is uh, how average American people in general feel nowadays about having such a great power with a nuclear arsenal. What do they think about it? Because it's really uh, powerful if you have these weapons, weapons. So you're asking me what do American people think about the fact that they are a nuclear power, a dominant yes. nuclear power? Yes, empire. Um, right. Remember, I, I'm Canadian. <laughs> Um, well, if they think about it, <laughs> I don't know. I find, um, I find a disconnect between Americans I know personally and the culture of the United States. I, I'll say it again. I don't think that the nuclear powers want to give up their nuclear weapons. They, it makes them top dog. And um, it, I don't think that they are going to voluntarily uh, do that. I think the rest of us are going to have to make that happen. Good answer. Good answer. A lot of Americans don't know what their government does in their name. The vast majority <laughs> of them don't know. Yeah, but you're, prob you're probably right, Helen. Probably the majority of them do not know. Some of us do, but not, uh, not everyone. And it depends on what we're doing for an occupation and what we're involved in. So uh, next hand up, please. Anybody else? Hands up. Any other questions for Helen? I don't see. Oh, Irina, you got one more. Go ahead, Irina. Come back on. Yeah, it's not about uh, nuclear weapon, but about speech weapon. Uh, could you recommend us how to prepare such a wonderful speech? <laughs> experience, 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 or something else? Where did you study such a great <laughs> knowledge? Um, <Thank> you. <laughs> I'm actually a student of something called um, NLP. Um, right. So I could, I would recommend. Um, just googling uh, neuro linguistic programming and how to construct a good speech, and you'll get some ideas there. Right. Yeah. It, it, it does. It does work. By the way, Irene. I don't know if you're in, into neuro linguistic programming, but it, they do have a structure for giving presentations. Primarily, you're selling thoughts, and if you're selling thoughts, and the other people get those thoughts, receive those thoughts, sometimes they act upon them. So it's very impactive has a big impact on people when you use those techniques. Okay, anybody else with a question? I don't see any other hands. Uh, let me try the second page. I don't see anybody on second page, first page, none. All right, all of us, if you will, please, let's give Helen a round of applause for her work again today. Thank you very, very much, Helen. Thank you for answering questions. Thank you. I have to say that you're, uh, you're bringing definitely a more controversial subject to our meeting, which is good. Uh, we have some very opinionated people on board here. Uh, there was 33 at the time. We're down to 29 now. And I can tell you of the opinionated people, uh, they don't all express their minds, but they listen. 
So on the people, the audience you have here will listen and take it for with their own grain of salt as to they, how they see it fits into their life. But you do have some very opinionated people on board here. So uh, I'm sure you reached a lot of us this evening with your comments and with your presentation. Um, Randall will have this in the recording and other people will be able to see this recording of those who are members. I think we're up to something like 300 people we send this out to now. So uh, it will be going out to a variety of different people. Okay, I'm going to take over again and go to my next slide if I can find it here. Uh, yep, just one second, down. Don't. Come on, come on, computer. My computer's not working either, just like Helen's. All right. I showed you last week, the, um, this was our number three child that we had for our project. Our primary signature project for our club is the Children's Rehabilitation Center here in St. Petersburg, Russia. Primarily focused on helping children with cerebral palsy and a variety of other things. Um, we have a goal of 10 children in this calendar year, not the rotary year, but the calendar year. And we have, we had our third child identified. We, we, and and that was just a very short video, very short one. This center is very dynamic. We now have our fourth child. As I mentioned to you, our goal is to get to 10 children by the end of the year, and we need your help to reach out and do this. A few of you this evening at the beginning mentioned that your clubs or districts are thinking about it, considering it. Thank you very, very much for that consideration. I hope some of those come too. Uh, we definitely want to help these children to walk again. Many of us have children and grandchildren who can run and play with all the other children. These children cannot. And we want to see them provided with the opportunity to get out and enjoy life as everyone else. If you ever have a chance to come to St. Petersburg, we can take you to the center and meet some of these children and they will just win your hearts over. They're so bubbling with excitement and enjoyment, just having an opportunity to progress a little bit. So we definitely need more help and we certainly will be willing to take you and show you once you're allowed to come back into Russia again. Please reach out, let us know if you have any questions. Also, I have a presentation that I can deliver to your club. If you have a club, a district, an organization, doesn't have to be Rotary, it can be any organization, a women's club or a men's club or some kind of business club. If you want a presentation, I can give them one. I will come online and visit them and tell them about this center as well as telling them about Rotary. So the, the offer is open. If you have a group, let me know and I'll be happy to show up and give them a presentation that talks about our, our children. All right, our speaker schedule coming up. On 9 June, Stephen's gonna be here. Stefan's gonna be here to talk about the Council on Legislation. And with him, there's gonna be Maria. Maria is one of the founders of the people who started originally with the Children's Rehabilitation Center. She's German and she's gonna to talk to us about the children's rehabilitation of, of the child. So we're gonna have two presenters next week, two of them instead of just one. The week after that on 16 June, we have the, uh, the person who is the outgoing president of the Netherlands of the Russian IC, Netherlands and Russian ICC and going to be our presenter on the 16th of June. On the 20th, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. On the 23rd, we have a special representative of Russia. Mikhail is going to come and talk to us. And then finally, on 30 June is one of Randall's primary projects he's been trying to get on board for us. The, the St. Petersburg Flood production, Protection Barrier from an engineer, Peter Hunter, who was involved in the designing and the building of the protection barrier for our lovely city here. And since it has been built and up at least twice, there has been an opportunity for that protection barrier to protect St. Petersburg from being flooded. So certainly it's a very, very interesting thing to listen to our own area being protected and how they're going to be doing it. So that's sort of what's on the slate for us. 
Uh, I'm back. Let me get out of here. I am back to my home page. At this time, we have a few of our members who are still with us from our own club, and I would like to offer those members an opportunity to say anything or make any comments, if they will, please. We're going to start off with uh, Andreas Bone. He's our treasurer and our primary person for our um, CRC, our Children's Rehabilitation Center. I caught him with his mouth full. I see him chewing. But um, Andres, do you have any comments for us this evening? First of all, Harry, hello to everybody. Sorry that I've been late for the meeting, but uh, business matters kept me in the office till nearly 10 minutes ago. Um, next week, I will have a meeting at the CRC uh, to see our fourth child and to say hello to the child and the, the, her mom, his mom, so his mom. And um, yeah, thank you from my side uh, to all of those who made a donation, which is a great help to the kids and their parents, which are in desperate need to get the health improved of the children, as uh, our President Michael said, that they can enjoy life together with other children and kids. So that's all from my side. I hope that we will be soon able to sponsor the fifth child. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank, thank you, Andres, appreciate that. Andres is also our club treasurer, folks, so he's the money man. And whenever the donations come, they come through us and then go directly to the center. There's nothing, nothing <clears throat> excuse me, nothing taken out by us for, for any kind of fees for handling it. It goes 100% to the center. And it takes about 2,500 euros to sponsor each child. What we do when money comes in is we start a kitty, we hold it until we have that amount. When we have that amount, 100% of it goes forward to the, the center for the next child. So they, we talk to them and they would prefer to do it that way instead of giving them incremental amounts. They would prefer that we hold it until we have enough for a full child. So that's what we're doing currently. Uh, Irina, another one of our members. Irina, any comments, please? I'm sorry, I, uh, I talking to me? No, no, I, I'm sorry, not you. Uh, uh, I, I, Irina Paliva, <laughs> I'll get, I'll get, no, I'll get, to, I'll get to you in just a moment. I'm getting to our members of our club right now. Excuse me, I'm sorry. sorry. I should have said, Irina Setsakova, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you for, uh, I would say it's amazing. We have such a great uh, opportunity to meet online. Bad that we have coronavirus, but great, we have such a great opportunity and we have, Excellent speech, speakers from all over the world. Thank you for finding such an interesting people. Thank you, Irene. Appreciate it. Mr. Rami, you're out walking around in Moscow. Any comments? No comments. Thank you so much. <laughs> you had good you had a good question earlier though, asking how can the individual help and what can the individual do? That was a very, very good question because we have a lot of individual people who would like to do something, but they're not quite sure what. So that's a very, very good question. All right, I, I, think that, I think that's all of our members. Now I'm going to open up the floor. Oh, I'm sorry, Antonina. I'm sorry, is your microphone working? Antonina. I killed the second uh, computer. So Sounds I bad. hope you, I, I, I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. We get uh, it's thank you, Helen. We are Canadians, both you and I, and some people here as well. You're very welcome to uh, make speech in ICC Canada, Russia. I will send you email with invitation, okay, later on. And I also was thinking that um, to deliver your message in L NLP <laughs> techniques, it would be nice if each of us uh, was using uh, internet opportunities. Uh, to share with all our friends and our pages uh, this particular meeting, um, not just, um, okay, anyways, it will 100 times at least or 200 times increase our uh, audience to get the message. Uh, and second, uh, I, I, I'm very proud because for two days, I am proud owner of in uh, Hans uh, Techniques, which is from Dora mobile phone. I moved to Samsung 
no <laughs> which is big big thing to me and i also upgraded one of computer at home to make my speech more presentable so my apologies for today's like a games on the screen uh, i will be more precise in the future hopefully and thank you very much everyone who found time to uh, uh, visit this wonderful uh, club meeting thank you Thank you, Antonina. Antonina is one of our honorary members over there in Canada, and she still has family back here in Russia. She's a contributor to our CRC. Um, she's just a superwoman. And uh, Antonina, we're, we always expect miracles. Yes, we always expect miracles out of you, right? I don't know which is bigger, the muscles in your arm or the muscles in your head, but you use them, girl, and you just keep going. You're doing wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate that. All right, let me get back now to Irina Palaliba. Any, any comments, please? Um, I I'm just wanted to say that I'm very grateful for letting me uh, participate in your meeting today. Uh, it took me more than nine hours to come from Blagovishinsk, which is in the Russian Far East on the border with right. China. And right. I came here to participate in St. Petersburg International Econo Economic Forum, and uh, I, it was very interesting for me. It is my first experience of uh, um, participating in the meeting of the International uh, Rotary Club. And uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Helen, for your presentation, and uh, thank you for. Uh, opening the question that are political because usually in our club uh, in Vagavishinsk we try to avoid uh, any political questions uh, and here uh, I, I see that it is uh, possible and the Rotary doesn't prohibit it to discuss it because uh, our life is all through it depends on the po po politi politicians at least um, and uh, I'm very thankful to you for um, letting me see how you work. Uh, I mean, uh, how you run the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that uh, maybe next time uh, you will find time uh, to participate in our meeting online. I will, if you let me, I will send you the invitation. If you give me your emails, uh, I would uh, like to start communicating between Bagavishas Rotary Club and the St. Petersburg International Rotary. I mean, if you'll put, great, that's super, that's super. And if you'll put an email address into the chat box, we will make sure we add, we will add okay. that, we will add that to our list. And uh, as I said, we're right now, we've got about a little over 300 people on our mailing list and we will add yours to it. And we'll make special note that you'd like to get together. Uh, maybe we can have a joint meeting possible, possibly, I don't know, but we'll certainly look at that and see what we can do with that. Absolutely, for sure. Okay, mm -hmm. Duncan, any message from Duncan? Any words? Uh, there, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, no, no specific words. Uh, most enjoyable. It, uh, I'm so pleased that uh, we're communicating with uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, many years ago, I visited Tomsk in Siberia, where my, my sister actually adopted a little girl. And I was, in fact, looking at some of my old videos from Tomsk back 20 odd years ago. <laughs> So uh, yeah, very enjoyable. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. And uh, Antonina, who was online earlier, was uh, in a club over there in Tomsk in, when she was in Russia. So we have some connections in Tomsk already. Oh, cool. Renya, Renya, how about any comments, Renya? It was a wonderful presentation, Helen. And uh, I passed along the information to a friend of mine who's the president-elect of the Streetsville Rotary Club, and she wants to do an outreach in the Chinese community, which she's part of, to increase membership in her club. And she's using the peace education prog uh, programs through Rotary as a way of doing that. Very good, very good. Yeah, isn't that just another one of the nine that's gonna to have to be worked on someday of the nine of the nine countries, China's one of them. So we're gonna to have to work on them someday, so. Uh, Natalia in the chat, any, any comments? 
Thank you so much, Helen. Uh, it was a great presentation. Now I'm thinking the person I should start working with is my grandson, who is eight, uh, because the other day I was talking to him on the phone and asked him what he was doing. He was working, um, he was uh, playing video games. I asked him a question, what were the video, video games about? And he said, oh, it's just people killing other people. I said, well, healing, that's not a good thing. Oh, Baba calls me Baba. This is, this is just a game. So, and you know, I still have a very unpleasant taste in my mouth, so to say, after this conversation. You know, um, eight-year-olds are being taught in a way that um, you can kill people as a game. Um, I was scared, to be honest with you. And I'm thinking that we do need to do something with the younger generation to uh, educating them, because this is our future. Right. And uh, um, uh, it's very important for them to be aware what is a war, what is what it means to kill, and um, I don't know whether it's possible, but gaming industry, uh, I wonder if something can be changed in their mindset. Mm -hmm. that's a, we need that's to hack into the gaming industry and every time somebody is killed, it turns into flowers. And uh, we can, if we do that, then there are gonna be flowers coming up everywhere instead of dead bodies coming up everywhere. So you're right. I think I, a good idea, Natalia, very, very good idea. Yes. Uh, Tom Ross, any comments? Tom, you with us? I am extremely interested uh, in the uh, presentation I've written to uh, many of the members attending today. And Helen, thank you so much. We're going to uh, take this and hopefully uh, have you speak to our district and our club in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd love to. I think, Helen, you're going to find that we have an outreach quite far uh, over the last nine months uh, from what Randall's been bringing in all these speakers and all these people. He's worked very, very hard to put this together. And um, he's got the bold work here doing most of it himself. And he has built up our member, our following quite well. So uh, he's done a super job and we'll get this Mike, out. Michael, all. I do it because I want more ladies in our club. <laughs> ah, you and your lady, I understand you do. We, we want more ladies. We got, we, we only got one rig, one member and a couple honorary members who are ladies. All the rest are men and, and only one young man. All the rest of them are a uh, <clears throat> little bit older. Uh, who else have I not got? Jillian, J Jillian, are you on board with us? Jillian, no? I see the name there, but I don't see anybody there. Okay. All right. Well, that pretty much wraps it up for all of us. I'm going to end the meeting here in about another minute after I put, give you some closing comments, and then we're going to stay on board probably for another five or so to chat with anybody who would like to chat afterwards. Closing comments. Tonight, I did something very unusual. I normally read the protocols, not only for our Rotary Club, but for many of the Toastmaster clubs that I belong to. I'm the Sergeant of Arms for them, and I read the protocols. And tonight, when I read through Helen's bio, and I read through what she's going to be talking about, I decided to strike a red line through politics and say it's okay to talk about politics tonight. And the way she used the word politics was not so political as it was meaningful to change. And I think that is a big, big difference. And we need more people, if they're gonna talk about politics, talk about it in the way that she did. So people actually think about politics and not just react to politics. So probably next week, depending on who's speaking, we'll probably have that no politics sign back up again. But uh, in the meantime, we get, if we get a controversial speaker in here, we certainly want to hear from them. We do not want to uh, limit their capability. And we have had speakers, some of them here, at least one that I can for sure remember, who was 100% pro-Russian, anti-American um, type person or whatever, 
and maybe not anti-American, but anti-West, and that's okay. We let him speak, we let him talk, we let him say his thing, and we listen. Getting other people's ideas is important. Hearing their viewpoint is very, very important. And when we hear these viewpoints, we're open to ideas that we may not have thought about before. Just like in Helen's presentation, she said before she got involved in this, she was not aware of a lot of things that have come to her now in the last year or two. She has learned an awful lot and all of us can learn from her presentation. So if we continue the education, education, education is the direction that we can go. And there is absolutely 100% nothing in Rotary that says we will not educate people. Now it may say some limits about what we educate them, but it doesn't say education is limited. So we can change the wording a little bit and call it education and help people as much as we can. So we should go forward and continue to do that. Uh, Helen, again, on behalf of all of our membership, we're very proud of you and your presentation and the, and the stand you have taken to try to make this go. We've got some noticeable people around the world who are working on these things. Uh, I will send you an email tomorrow with a couple other speakers we have had who are definitely in the peace movement. I don't know if they're going to connect with you, but they're also doing things for peace. And maybe there's a connection with them. So we'll see what they have to say also, and we'll put you in contact with them. Uh, it you. doesn't hurt to find fellow Rotarians who are look, trying to get for, go for peace. I think that's going to help everybody. So let me get my bell. <laughs> Any other following comments before I close the official meeting from anybody? I think I covered everybody on the screen. Randall, go right ahead. Yeah, and just one little thing. Next week, we'll have a, a tag team. We'll have two speakers. Right. So we'll have our the past district governor for what used to be Western Russia, District 2220. He, Stefan Stein will be talking about the Council on Legislation because he's elected uh, as our representative to that. And we will have Maria van Molke, who started the charitable foundation that supports the Center for the Rehabilitation of the Child. So both are going to be different topics. They actually know each other uh, and they reinforce uh, what we're doing here. So it will be a very interesting meeting. Okay, very good. And Helen, I just got a note from Rami in the uh, chat box. His note to you is that the Rotary Dubai members, Dubai in, in the UAE, members are building a peace center in Dubai. They may be willing to hear your speech. So we can connect you with them also and see if they would like to have, and they're going to be English speaking. So they're going to understand you clearly. And maybe you can also have an impact over there in that part of the world. That would um, be wonderful. Yeah. So we'll pass that. We'll pass that on to you, dear. So thank you. Thank you very, very much again. Okay. Let me officially close the meeting. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it fill goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the Rotary four-way test.
class or on the playground with your friends at school, you'll find that hurtful words and actions really aren't too cool. So as you make your choices of what to do or say, remember that old four-way test and you will be okay. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the rotary four-way test. And will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the rotary four-way test.